November 8th, 1939, Easy Eddie, a notorious mob lawyer, died for his son. I don't mean that in a metaphorical way either. Easy Eddie O'Hare wasn't just considering leaving the mob for his family. Easy Eddie was already gone. Easy Eddie had closed down his mob dealings, severed his ties, and testified against Al Capone. The Al Capone. Eddie was one of the bookkeepers who turned Capone's finance records over to the authorities, which landed Capone in Alcatraz prison. That's how close Easy Eddie's ties were with the mob. This man could touch the crime king of prohibition. But Easy Eddie didn't do it all over a guilty conscience. Eddie regularly took mobsters on his clients, and he operated a crooked racetrack. When the last owner of the track died, Eddie took over the business. He also convinced the grieving widow to sell the dead owner's patent to Eddie, a patent for a little electric rabbit that ran around the track so the greyhounds would chase it. That's how Eddie made his fortune off a dead man's patent and by shaking hands with politicians and criminals who gambled on the greyhounds. So why did Eddie do it? Why betray Al Capone? Why risk everything he'd built, all the money he'd made as a mob associate? One word, legacy. Easy Eddie had a son named Butch, who was trying to get into the Naval Academy so he could go fight the Japanese in World War II. But there was a problem. To get into the Academy, Butch needed a recommendation letter from a congressman, and he needed a pristine reputation. Connections to congressmen, Eddie could swing. But the clean reputation, <laughs> that wasn't so easy for Easy Eddie. But easy or not, he would do it. Easy Eddie handed Cabone to the cops, got his son Butch into the Naval Academy, and cleaned up his act, mostly. When Easy Eddie died, he looked surprised. You can see it in the photos taken after his death. Easy Eddie, eyes wide, staring straight ahead. There's broken glass and blood all over the seat, the door, the dash. But even though Capone's hitmen got their revenge on the lawyer, Eddie won in the end. Because Eddie's son, Butch O'Hare, also died at the wheel four years later. And just like his father, Butch also died surrounded by broken glass, blood, and bullet holes. But Butch would do it building a new family legacy, something grander than a reputation of mob connections and crooked dog races. Butch O'Hare would die in the cockpit of a fighter plane, doing something so unbelievable, so heroic, that they would name the Chicago airport after him. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, The Extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no dawn on the internet and get to the facts. If you're aiming to leave a legacy through your children, getting an international airport named after you isn't a bad start. The O'Hare family name went from being a footnote in the saga of Al Capone to saving an aircraft carrier to finally being the name everyone hears when they touch down at Chicago O'Hare Airport. If Eddie were alive today, he'd probably agree. Worth it. On today's episode, we're exploring legacy. And because there's a lot to talk about, we're tackling this in two parts. Today, we'll cover legacy part one, which concerns myths about inheritance and reputation. Myths like, myth one, leaving cash is the only worthwhile legacy. Besides, there's no way leaving my son a bouncy castle made of cash could backfire. Myth two, 
What about family businesses or trust funds? If I can control how my children spend the money, that should secure their future, right? Myth three, can you pass on a reputation? If Butch O'Hare hadn't become the Navy's biggest badass, would he have been known as the mob lawyer's son until the day he died? Those are the myths for today. Inheritance and reputation. Next week, we'll talk about talent. Can you pass talent on to your kids? Can you buy talent for them? But for now, I want to tell Joe what Butch O'Hare did to earn his father's sacrifice. So uh, I know that, like, for what I know from World War II history, uh, most people get a little white cross in a yard somewhere and uh, maybe like a medal. How a, a, an airport is big. How did O'Hare get an airport? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right. You get like a small plaque or something. Right, yeah. I, like they're, the country is littered with um, little plaques in front of like a wreckage of an airplane or something. He got this named after him because he was such a brave aviator and he saved so many of his fellow sailors' lives, but he saved even more civilians. Okay. Some of his brave missions may have been what won us the war. Oh, well, okay, that's kind of big. Um, I mean, like, there are movies about a sole lone person winning us a war. So are we going to get to... How much of that will we hear before we get to the... Uh, the spoiler, the second half of the show, we're going to go over exactly what he did. But can you give us a teaser? Well, the funny thing about this is Butch is not from Chicago either. He's from St. Louis. <laughs> so why wouldn't they name the St. Louis airport after him, Joe? Uh, is it because less people land there? I have no idea. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. He used to visit Chicago. He never lived there when his dad was doing his gangster stuff. And Easy Eddie himself only had a cup of coffee there. Of course, when you're in coots with the mob and Al Capone at that time, Chicago was the, the hub city. <laughs> right. That's where all the movies take place. A lot of this is about the aircraft carrier, the Lexington. Okay. So he didn't save Chicago. No, he didn't save Chicago. This was um, in the Pacific during World War II. And this is all about the attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, the Lexington was sent on a mission to go attack over with some other ships. And so it was out there. The Japanese bombers came in to destroy that because if they would have destroyed all the carriers, we would have lost World War II. We'd have lost, there would have been no battle in Midway. It would have been over. Okay. So we couldn't have kept the Japanese from bombing our whole West Coast. So the Japanese had already taken out a bunch of our ships in Pearl Harbor. We sent the rest over and they were going to destroy the rest, basically. Right. So those ones weren't home. So they had to go find them. So these bombers were coming at the Lexington. The first wave of them were all shot down by the anti-aircraft from the ships. Okay. Mowed them down. But then a whole nother wave came, and the only person that was in line to fight them was brave boy Butch and his co-pilot, Duff Dumaho. Okay. <laughs> I love that name, don't you? That sounds Duff-a-ho? like something like a, a football <laughs> coach would scream. Duvo, yeah, yeah. I, I'm in. So, so let me just, Butch and Duff, let's just go there. Okay, Butch and Duff, yeah. So the Japanese bombers, they had this great name. They were actually built by Mitsubishi, which is a huge international company. I think of them as the cars we drive around now. Yeah, I'm imagining uh, bombers with like little car spoilers on the back. <laughs> well, they nicknamed, the Americans nicknamed for them, well, they called them Bettys. Okay. I think that's funny. That doesn't sound like something that's going to come blow your friggin' ship up and kill everybody. I have heard bombers called Bettys before. Is it because they had Mitsubishi in the name? Was it just like easier to pronounce? I have no idea. I just think you'd do something a little bit mean, like fire or something. I don't know. Right. Fire dragon. Yeah. (laughs) So this guy was brave. He had heart. You even said he has balls. He's heroic. He's a true American. I'm talking about Butch now. Hero crazy so he's just going right at the bombers he takes down five japanese bombers and if those would have got through they would have probably destroyed the lexington okay so butch and his wingman take down five bombers now it's important to know what he was up against here usually when the anti-bomber the car the jets go out they go in teams there's five or six of them 
but they were all repositioning. He was the only one that could do this, so he was flying solo. To add to that, Joe, Duff's uh, gun went out, so he couldn't fire. So he had to fly and fire from the pilot thing. Okay, so I've I've seen pictures of bombers. So basically, uh, Butch O'Hare, his wingman drops out, and he's flying. I, have you ever seen the pictures of like, I've seen American bombers in pictures. They look like porcupines. They have so many guns coming out. Like they're, they are just made of 40 cows that are just sticking out of everywhere. And rounds are just flying out of them. Right, okay, so he's flying against eight of those. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that sounds suicidal. At Flying best. right into them. Right. A kamikaze mission. But he was brave. He was brazen, strong, strong-willed, and of course, very, very skilled. Okay. So we'll, um, in our second half when we get into uh, Legacy Part 2, we'll do uh, like a World War II, we'll even do like the crazy radio World War II voice. We'll like, like in the Pacific, like we'll do that. <laughs> and we'll good. go through uh, um, blow by blow what Butch did. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt you too much, but what are we looking forward to? I want to give you a timeline on this. So the Lexington had sailors on it. Cr- whole crew was 2,600 people. That's the number of people that Live Sea was protecting, not to mention the ships. So if Butch would have wasn't there to save the Lexington, if he hadn't gone to the Naval Academy, which he couldn't have attended because if Easy Eddie hadn't cleaned up his reputation and gotten a congressman on his side, that's kind of like if your father died to get you into a prestigious private school and to pay him back, you were the one who stopped the Twin Towers disaster during 9-11, the terrorist attack, because that's how many people died in that. That is wild. And if my father got me into private school, the payback would have been, I would have given him like a Christmas card at some point. <laughs> Delivering on a, a, a ship like that is completely insane. Does bad things ever live, lead to good things? That's got to be one of the few times in history, right? Right, that somebody could actually leave a legacy and it, it pays everybody off, that it, that it saves, you know, it saves a fleet. And do a 180 on morals. Right. Um, I think part of the argument we're making here, and we're going to really, really dive into this over the course of uh, this two-parter, um, can we leave something better than money? Is there something better than money to leave? Um, because Easy Eddie left a reputation, both a good one and a bad one. That's kind of like the theme of our show today. Um, Easy Eddie was trying to escape leaving a, a mob reputation. Um, and what he ended up leaving was Butch and, and Butch's military reputation. Um, when you think of inheritance, what do you usually think of? I think of... a. Uh... The kids being real interested, coming out to helping the guys get in the hospice thing, and then they sell the house and they divvy up the money. Right. That's that's what my family went through. We, it, it wasn't it wasn't a quote unquote inheritance. It was we just got rid of their stuff. Yeah. And yeah, I, I had a grandparent, and we it was it was everything you said. What do they call those sales they have? Oh, oh, uh, not garage sales, but. No, estate sales estate sales yeah. right <laughs> where you all pick like raccoons over <laughs> right exactly people just passed <laughs> try to find a real bargain in there i always uh, i hate to like movie and cartoon everything but i think of scrooge mcduck whenever whenever i think of like uh leaving things for your your heirs i always think of just like oh it's gonna be like a oh, uh, tower of money basically like gold <laughs> little little coins you can swim through um I also wonder how much uh, Easy Eddie left the family. I, I mean, like, I couldn't find that in research. But you'd think, like, a mob lawyer with a patent would, would have, you know, quite a bit of cash to leave. But um, that's beside the point because it's not like uh, it's not like Butch could have done anything with it. Like, he ended his, his naval service in the Navy, so. Um, have you ever went, like, uh, visited a business and it is family-run, family-owned? Absolutely, and I've been a part of them before. Oh, okay. Uh, in what way? Um, I worked with my ex-wife, my brother-in-laws. The worst thing about working in a family business is sometimes you get treated really good and sometimes you get abused. 
they will fire you and then call you up and say, why are you not at work right now? They work you more, not less than a, <laughs> a normal job? Right, because it's family. The boundaries aren't as cut dry. You're never off work. What? Okay, I see that. Yeah, <laughs> work Yeah, around the dinner table when everyone's going to talk about what they did for the day. It's just glaring and being like, you know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of when you think of family business? I think of uh, corner stores and hotels. Oh, yeah. Like, I think of the ones where it's like the same family has been running it since you grew up. And, and you you're just you wave at them and you, you all know each other by first name. We did an episode about that, about Indian hotel owners in this country. Yeah, the, the Patel Hotel Cartel. And we, we had a great article that we drew from for that. So. And that's generational. It yeah I so because of that article because like of of confirmation bias basically I had assumed that was more common and more stable than money like when we started doing the research into this I thought that we were going to find out that an inherited business was actually really stable and that like maybe instead of a trust fund say I, okay so we're gonna let's let's do this whole episode where you and I are wealthy. Oh, that'd be great. I you and I, full time. Yeah, we we both have ten million dollars. Um, what? Uh, we'll call our shots now. Like you and I are gonna use our baseball bat and point out into the outfield and say, you know, like that's where we're gonna hit our home run. Um, what are you going to leave your kids? What should I leave mine if we both got money? This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to downtown Seattle or downtown Portland, and I'm gonna buy a parking garage. Oh, okay. And I'm gonna make a will so these bastard kids of mine can't sell it or borrow money against it all they can do is have the income okay what about you the, uh, the, I, I like your plan i'm doing your plan now <laughs> come up with your own ideas oh, okay <laughs> uh i i'm spending all of it on um beanie babies because i believe those will pay off pokemon cards i would um i'm i believe uh, before these articles i started with trust funds i was like hey I will set up a trust fund. You can only touch it if you go to school. Um, maybe you can withdraw from the trust fund that I set up if uh, you know if you have like a solid business plan or something. I would have like um, somebody managing it. Uh, you know, it, it would be limited. I would dictate when they can draw money from it. And and Joe Ghost from Beyond the Grave will tell you how to spend your money. Damn it. I can see that, like this miser, tightwad <laughs> accountant <laughs> attorney that is old school, and he's not giving you anything. Right. He's just saying, his first thing when you come to him for the business plan is no. He just shakes his head. That's his job. <laughs> I, he gets paid you know, a percentage to just shake his head at my family. Um, so, yeah, let's go through the stats. Uh, I want to know if, if Todd and I are, um, if our families are going to stay rich. So, would it surprise you to know that most family businesses fail, uh, usually the second or third generation. It, it does because you would think that these people bought in at a different time. So they bought in the 70s when, when land was cheap, when materials were cheap, and they were established. They get good service for a long time. So you think that would stick, and no matter how screwed up you would, you'd still be able to survive. Right, like if your parents buy a corner store for like, you know, a hundred thousand dollars back when it was super cheap, and then like you come of age, your your parents hand you a store and well, now it's worth like, you know, uh, a million dollars. And to think Joe, they grew up in this. They should be they should know this business like the back of their hand. They worked there as a kid. They know the insides and outs of the business. They should be paying attention to competition. They should be thinking of new ideas. Exactly. You, you would think that they would want to innovate when they take over and that they would, having grown up in the business, they don't need to be trained. They know everything. Um, it, it shocked me to read into this, um, but uh, it looks like uh, there's a, um, in this article uh, by Harvard Business Review, they use the phrase shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Um, meaning by the third generation, the business is usually lost. Uh, according to the article, we're going to link everyone to, um, about 70% of family owned businesses fail or are sold by the second generation. 70%. 70%. So, Holy cow. Yeah. So, so you, you have 70%, you have, you know, uh, 
if you have three kids, uh, two out of those three are likely to lose your business. That and has seven out of ten. The, all the grandparents are rolling around in their in their grave, right? Right. They're like, yeah, I left you a store. Or I left you a parking garage. What's wrong with you? That that was that was going to be your yeah. That was going to get you money forever, so you never have to get like a, a, a you know a, a difficult job. You don't you don't have to work construction. Um, but that's not usually the way kids see it. Um, the the seventy percent, uh, most of them fail or are sold before the second generation gets to take over. I'm guessing sold is a huge part of it. The the part where the first generation makes smart choices, they're hungry, they're lean, they they go after a business, they buy it, they build it. And then once it's built, it's much easier for the second generation to justify if we sell this, we live comfortably for 40 years or whatever. Yeah, instant gratification that we buy the boats, the houses, we could do right now whatever we want. Right. This actually um I went to uh yeah, whenever I see businesses that are like family operated for X generations, like a hundred years, I used to just shrug. Like that used to be like, oh, you're just bragging, or that's just meaningless marketing. Now that I have seen this, um, because by the third generation, ten percent are active, meaning like by the third generation, by grandkids, your grandkids have already sold or lost your business uh, to the tune of ninety percent chance it fails. So if you see a sign that says operated by this family for 100 years, they're doing the impossible. Like they, they have beat that 90% chance of failure. We've seen two in them. Since Henry Ford built Ford Motor, his heir have been trying to run that in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. From our Lee Iacolka episode, yeah. Like after hearing about what uh, spoiled uh, um, uh, dandies his kids were. Entitled dummies. How did they have a business that long? Yeah. Um, there is kind of a reason, too, why... Uh, you know, the, the kids of businesses uh, oftentimes um, get a bad reputation. Now, the 10% that remain active, I, the 10% that make it in the third generation, I assume it's because they communicated very well that the families did. That's something that's going to come up over and over again in both part one and two. The families that communicate with each other and have open business ideas and open talks about money and they, they're responsibly communicative they seem to really do well. Like th- that's the ten percent that succeed. Do you think that some of that too is the love of the business? Their identity is tied into that. Oh, I absolutely believe that because if you grow up in a business, you may grow to hate it. It just might represent things your parents made you do, chores like or like you, a sports father kind of deal. Right, you had to stock shelves or something, and you hate you know you secretly hate the business they left you. Um, but yeah, that ten percent that survives, they're the type that would put up a plaque that says "family owned for a hundred years." <laughs> Um, to kind of contrast this, okay, so we're going to ask why kids lose businesses. Um, publicly owned firms usually have their CEO for about six years. That seems to be about the average. Um, and that's a good thing. Like we, everyone thinks you want to have the same captain sailing the ship forever. Um, what a higher turnover for a CEO means, uh, from the outside, I'm, I'm again, we, we don't hold doctorates, but from the outside and from the articles and sources we've looked at, um, CEO turnover means that somebody fresh is coming in and they're recently educated on the subject and they have ideas and, and they kind of can cope better with shifting technology, shifting business models and new consumer behavior, what people actually want. Whereas um, you have a kid come in to Ford and he thinks everybody wants a gas guzzler that can roar down the highway at 700 horsepower. And let's just do what we always have done. Right. And then you get Lee Iacocca that's like, no, let's build something that's more economical and that everybody wants and let's base it on a Japanese model. That's when you start getting family businesses that sort of crash and burn. How do you feel about the parking garage? Well, not if they're going to cash it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can just see them driving around and just pissing it away in all kinds of weird ways. Some doing drugs, some traveling too much. Right. I Yeah, if you have a solid business plan and you're in that 90% of kids that get rid of your business, it, it, it's probably because they sold it because they want to be comfortable. We did a great article about entitlement and how, but usually when, especially when we studied entitlement too, you would think that these kids are the same DNA as their parents. Right. And so they're supposed to have that bite and that fight. 
Yeah, they they don't have the hunger that the parent has, so they're not going to represent the business in the same way. Um, okay, so let's let's do Scrooge McDuck. If if we can't pass on your parking garage to your kids, um, let's just hand them a pile of money. When somebody passed in your family, we don't need to know who and but how, did they? How much did they leave? How much did they have set up for you? Um, it was in, it was in the less than ten thousand. <laughs> okay, I, I like that. I start with let's not get personal with who it is, but let's talk exactly how much. Uh, I'm rounding up. It's ten grand. Okay. Um, we'll have all of our data and the links as usual, but um, the average American retiree is probably going to leave about a hundred seventy-seven thousand to their heirs. See, that sounds about right. See, this is what you do. Let's say you have three or four kids from the age we are, and you passed away today. Okay. Three or four kids, and they all had three kids. A couple attorneys in there. It, it, there's not much for anybody. Right. Yeah, it, 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 it gets eaten slowly. Like, like as they go the pie. Th- through the process, <laughs> yeah, as they pass. Yeah, the taxes, the come probate. Out. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard it? Uh, the the great silver, what is it? The the silver inheritance that's coming when the when baby boomers are starting to die off, and we're expected to get um, because they're such a huge generation. They're also calling it the great wealth transfer. It'll be like the biggest transfer of money from one generation to the next in America. Like it, it historically, it will you know, it'll be a, an explosive amount of wealth transferred. Um. If you want to know, so sorry to spoil my own sort of like uh, my plan, which was, you know, uh, leave money and leave a trust fund um, during that great wealth transfer. Um, it's not going to go well. Uh, well. What you're thinking is they don't have a business to run to the ground. They can set themselves up and pay off all their bills. So be comfortable. Right. That's what we're hoping for is when we leave money, if we leave that average of 177,000, uh, then that will be enough for them to set up their life. Um, according to a survey of consumer finances, the median inheritance is 69,000. Uh, the average is higher. Um, if we talk trust funds, it's way higher because apparently you don't set up a trust fund unless you really have money. Yeah. Uh, if you are a poorer American, poorer or just like middle class, you die and you just leave a, a wad of cash. Your your wallet falls out, and then there's like 170 <laughs> something thousand in it. If you are, um, if you set up a trust fund, um, I the the median wealth transfer from a trust fund is 285 thousand. The average is about four million. So. Y- it seems like trust fund is the way to go if you have millions, not thousands. Um, but when uh, the great wealth transfer happens, when when boomers, you know, sadly start checking out, that's when um, uh, one in three millennials or, or one in three, um, you know, s- sons, grandsons, whatever, uh, one in three are expected to blow it all. And this is according to Market Watch. Um, they had a a really good summary, basically, of why. It's because we're all in debt. <laughs> right. Well, it's better than 7 out of 10, though. Yeah, it could be It could be worse. Um, but the reason why that is a bad thing, if everyone listening is nodding their heads, they're just like, yeah, of course, well, millennials are going... They all have student debt. All, all millennials have student debt. Student debt is, is considered like the... One of the greatest economic threats facing America right now. Um, uh, the oh, was it Time called millennials the second lost generation because they aren't getting they're not going to get out of debt in their lifetime uh, as a generation. Um, yeah, when when boomers die off and leave all that money to millennials, one in three millennials will blow every cent of it, but that will go to debt. So if if they were buying cars. Or if they were buying, uh, um, you know, Beanie Babies or something, that would at least stimulate the economy. One in three blowing it on debt—that's not going to stimulate anything except for banks and loan organizations who are already basically wealthy, and they're not spending that money on Beanie Babies and cars. They are going to basically use it to stay in, well, in power uh, effectively. Um, have th- there's a, a guy named Lord David Willits of the Royal Institution. And um, he proposed an idea for the UK because Britain is going through the same thing. Um, like their their millennials can't buy houses, 
Um, they're having a major housing crisis. They live on an island, apparently. I don't know geography. I assume Britain is still an island. And um, they're having problems where millennials aren't buying houses. They're buying it so late that it's um, m- most houses are owned by boomers. And instead of millennials buying houses, boomers are just buying second houses and renting them out for more income. Well, yeah, because you can't move to the suburbs. It's an island. That's why. Right. But, yeah. So they can't move out just the ocean. cost of it is just not, you know, you right. have to buy it, bought in 50 years ago to have a chance. Right. So this guy proposed, uh, uh, Lord David Willits, uh, he proposed the idea that 30-year-olds, like millennials, when you hit 30 in, in Britain, you might get a 10,000-pound um, inheritance. No, coming, in hate, coming of age inheritance that's um, basically managed by the state. And uh, everybody kind of scoffed at him. They're, they kind of shook their heads. They're like, 10,000 is nothing. That, that's, that's not enough to do anything. You know, why would we set that up as an organization or an institution? And he said, he's like, look, no, millennials are so buried. That's life changing for for boomers. That's nothing. Um, he, he has this whole hour long talk where he establishes that, you know, the idea that somebody on a pension, they call them pensioners in Britain, that pensioners um, are historically thought of as poor. Here in America, we have an, a senior citizens discount. <laughs> yeah. If if I go to Old Country Buffet to eat, they will offer me a discount if I'm, what, 55, 65? Um, the idea that older folks on retired benefits are poor, that they don't have enough money to afford the full cost of a meal, it's flipped. It, it is now in Britain, um, pensioners make more money than boomers, and same thing might happen soon if it hasn't already here. But that's Where, why the boomers here have so much to leave, so much to leave as an inheritance, because... They bought in early, have right. their houses paid off, and the jobs now that just give you retirement don't do pensions anymore because they're too expensive. Right, exactly. Uh, if anybody, um, if anyone thinks that uh, the the myth is, well, boomers just planned better, millennials don't. If anyone believes that an entire generation just simply failed to plan as well as their uncle who just bought his second house instead of a boomer being able to buy their first, or a, sorry, a millennial being able to buy their first, then you should probably read up on economy. An entire generation does not simply forget to start investing. Yeah, they just put, they need to put their money in envelopes. That'll make a difference. They just don't save. <laughs> right. It's like, why haven't they bought their first house for $50,000? What's wrong with you, millennials? Yeah, our first house payment was two hundred sixty dollars. Right, exactly. Um, I have I mentioned how much I hate uh, um, banking and hedge fund and inheritance websites. Yeah, you talk my ear about it every time we're riding around together. Yeah, any any. I never ask. You just bring it up. Uh, yeah, I can't. Anytime we do a, a episode that touches on economy, my my ire and my hatred for uh, basically third party institutions that want to manage your money it's it's so evident. Um, yeah, if you are looking to leave money to somebody, um, there are so many websites that use, uh, statistics. The statistic we just mentioned that 35% of inheritance are squandered, that one in three will be thrown away. And they use that to convince boomers to, or retirees to not leave an inheritance. Like they, they keep, they have these websites that are like, you know, one in three will, you know, uh, retirees will leave an inheritance and it'll just go away. Your, your children will squander it. Um, but again, th- that's not being squandered. That's millennials using, you know, inheritance money to get out of debt. I, if, if anyone thinks that I am biased because I'm young ish and, and I'm thinking I'm going to get an inheritance that will get me out of debt. That is not true. I am not in debt, nor do I have anyone in my family who could possibly leave me more than $10 and a handshake. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I am official. I don't know about you, Todd. I'm going uh, screw these financial institutions. <laughs> uh, so um, do you want to talk about my trust fund plan? You got one. Well, it, it was at the start of this, you're going to leave a parking garage. I'm leaving a trust fund. Um, I think it's important to say that neither Joe and I have kids, so we're going to have to get a really <laughs> good young mentee and give them, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> we, we'll have to come together and leave. Um, yeah, the the next host of the Reengineered You, uh, we'll leave them this. <laughs> here's here's some foam walls. Uh, that's your trust fund. I think we can give it to a cult leader or something. I'm in for that. Yeah, the, the, the cult show. Um, 
Well, my plan isn't so sound either, if it helps at all, uh, if it consoles you about leaving your family business. Less than 2% of the U.S. population actually gets a trust fund, because it is, when we say top 2% or 2% own everything, um, yeah, you don't leave a trust fund unless you have enough money to establish one. And uh, 7 out of 10 wealthy families lose their fortune by the second generation, Um and by the third generation, that number has jumped to 90%. So we are, it's almost the same statistics as leaving a business. If you leave money, like in a trust, you can designate how the trust is spent. You can try to um, establish uh, an inheritance, but you have the same amount uh, of chance uh, of yeah. basically having that money carry on through your generations delays the inevitable right it just delays it uh, um leave a business seven out of ten chance in the second generation it goes away nine out of ten chance it goes away by the third generation the same stands for leaving a pile of cash you just get to designate when they withdraw the money from your trust fund you do not get to tell them you know if they hang on to it if it changes their life you know if if they if they make something of it just think of this. As hard as you're working to get these plans in place to protect your family, they're working just as hard to plan to squander this away. Right. Or if they plan to do the best thing with it possible, they still need to be able to communicate that intent with you. If you just expect to drop money on somebody someday when you pass, like like it's breaking bad, you're Walter White, and you're just going to leave a pallet of money in any form. Uh, you have to have daily conversations with them throughout your life to to sort of educate them on what got you to that wealth. Uh, I'm going to quote um, a, a president of a consulting firm. This was uh, somebody used to go on CNN, and this is who they quoted on Market Watch. Uh, they said simply, the people who created the wealth were often obsessive, but their kids are not hungry. So we're just going to leave it at that. So it doesn't matter what form of wealth that takes, businesses, trust funds, whatever, um, nine out of ten chance that your grandchildren have used it up, uh, put it into debt, or have um, eaten it. I want to talk to you about Easy Eddie and how this all started. Now, he was a very hardworking Irish-American, extremely ambitious. He got married when he was very young, only 19 years old. And he was a family man. He had three kids, one son we know who was Butch, and he had two daughters. He didn't come from any money. He didn't have an inheritance. He didn't have a trust fund. Nothing was given to him. He lived above his father-in-law's convenience store. And so he worked for family, and we kind of talked about. To almost literally the setup we just made, where he inherited a small business, or he worked for his family business. He worked for his, his father-in-law, but he didn't get that business. He just worked. He was just a blue-collar, hardworking Irishman. But at night, he would study, and he got his law degree. Okay. But everything I read about him, and if you see pictures of him, he looks like this gregarious, outgoing, life-of-the-party kind of guy, a guy who would make a deal. Okay. I like that. But his big monster break came. When he got hired to do a patent, and it's something that we all know, even if we're not into racing, it's that it's that rabbit that runs around the dog track that the dogs chase. When I read that part, that it was the mechanical rabbit, I was excited just because I'm a child mentally, and, and just thinking, like, he had the patent for the mechanical rabbit. I don't know why that excited me. I don't think it's so much he started with a lot. He just had a very big break. So the guy who, the, the original inventor, his name was Owen Patrick Smith. So he hired Easy Eddie to patent it. But the real good luck came in, not not the patent money. It was that Owen Patrick Smith died. And Easy Eddie, Easy Eddie's kind of got a sleazy uh, ring to it, doesn't it, a little bit? Uh, oh, totally, yeah, you used, can't. Used car salesman, but a little more, attorney used car salesman. Easy Eddie is almost like a joke name now that you would hear for a lawyer. It, it reminded me of like a Simpsons character, honestly. So he sees the moment. This guy who invented this is passed away. So Easy Eddie goes to the to the widow and buys the patent from her. Now, I don't know this. I couldn't find any of this in the research. But I'm suspicious that our hero here 
didn't pay full price. He didn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Uh, you think a man named Easy Eddie didn't pay what the patent was worth to the widow of the man who just invented the mechanical rabbit? I could see him, hand, you know, hugging her, consoling her at the funeral, <laughs> you know, and then said, just sign here, dear. I'll take care of all this money. You, you don't want to worry about money at a time like this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Pennies on the dollar. Also imagine, I don't, apropos of nothing, this isn't upheld by the research. I'm also imagining that, like, the the man who's passed, Smith, it's just like his, his, she is tired of all of the mechanical rabbits all over the house. Like, whatever he's tinkering on to invent this thing, it's just littering their house, and she's like, get rid of these rabbits. You're probably right, right? She's fed up with it. I don't care what it costs. But this turned out to be just a gold mine, because every... They're expensive because you got the baton on them. You can charge whatever, and every single track needs them because it's a standard for racing. Right. Now, this is the thing that leads to the next big thing. We always talk about this with good guys, right? They bought, started this business. You know, they started this, this software business like Elon Musk, and then they got into PayPal, and then they got into Tesla. But this is like the opposite. Yeah. So he, he pulls this deal for this patent, got some of the dog tracks. Well, who does he meet? He meets the original gangster, the worst gangster of all time, or the biggest gangster of all time, Al Capone. Okay, so uh, Electric Rabbits leads us to Al Capone. And right off the bat, they got together and they owned three tracks together. One in Chicago, one in Miami, and one in Boston. Oh, holy hell. Okay, so when we talk about him being mobbed up, he, mobbed up, he owning several dog tracks with Al Capone is pretty close. And I don't know about nowadays, but back in those days, Mafia was all over that kind of business. Right, exactly. Yeah, the tracks do not have a great reputation. They're probably a little more corporate now. but Yeah, I'm betting. Well, I don't bet, but you know what I mean. Um, so in this section of the podcast, in part one, uh, we want to talk about what Eddie actually did leave his kids. Uh, and what he was about to leave, if he owned three dog tracks uh, and and he was in business with Al Capone, was he was about to leave the reputation of a mob lawyer. Um, so if if you had kids, uh, let's let's hypothetical this: if you had kids or I had kids, what reputation would we we be, we be leaving? I mean, as far as values and. I always keep thinking of who you are, like DNA, like your your physical health, you know. Okay. <laughs> you have a healthy, but that's not really something you can control. I guess you did, so if you take good care of yourself. and Right. Uh, just, only just now have science started catching on to, like, bits of DNA that can actually activate or deactivate called methyl markers and or, you know, epigenetics. <clears throat> it's a whole field we won't get into, but um, if if you can leave you know, health consciousness, education, whatever you call it, um, that's helpful. But if you can leave, um, like, a personal reputation, like, uh, if you're super well-known, say you and I were, like, famous public speakers, say, um, would people expect our kids to be able to string three sentences together? Absolutely, or if you were just famous musician. And so you get a you get a band and you get a record deal just because of your dad's Bob Dylan. Right, we did a, an episode on uh, uh, Fogarty, and you know his his father was a, a band leader, and and he expected himself to be you know an amazing musician. So you leave him with a skill. So you don't leave him cash. You leave him with a skill, and and that that's something they love too, and they take it to the next level, and that's a security blanket. Right, that reputation carries. Um, you had in our notes, our original doc notes, uh, Rosemary Clooney and George Clooney. So was it just because they're very attractive or, or were they passing on skills to each other? That would be passing on skills, right? I think so. Um, what? what uh, so my surface level thought is usually they are passing on looks <laughs> that one of them is attractive, the other one's attractive, and that's what will get them the jobs. But I really think that, especially with like creative things, like actors have to teach each other stuff. What about connections? Oh, that too. Yeah, I, I know what's his face from this talent agency. We're gonna take you there and get you a commercial next week, and that's what it you know starts with child stars, I guess. Well, I always you know they first of all they get them introduce them to everybody. I always think about um, where we talked about Johnny Depp. We did an episode on Johnny Depp, and his stepfather 
was Robert Palmer, who was a very famous rock singer. That's right. And you say, well, that's not a coincidence. These Hollywood people and these New York people kind of travel in the same circles. Right, exactly. If you if you have a phone number you can point to from your Rolodex and call them, then you've already got like a huge lead uh, and somebody who will listen to you when you when you call that phone. If your you know name is recognizable by the voice on the other side, and we also know if you're established and you have more means, your kids are how much more likely Joe to be creative, to be into the arts, to not have to go work at the factory. Right. We had a Smithsonian article that talked about how like. I don't remember the exact number, but it was like you know every every hundred thousand dollars you make more, you have like a higher percent chance for your kids to be in a creative field. So yeah, um, yeah, it, having a safety net like that makes you more willing to risk and become creative. Um, so what we're talking about is like let's let's get this back a little bit to uh, Eddie O'Hare, um, the money he made from those those mechanical rabbits may have given his children sort of like uh, that money may have given them sort of license to broaden their horizons, to think about going to do other things. But reputation definitely sticks with us um, and not necessarily in the way you would think. So what we're talking about, um, Todd introduced me to the idea that Bruce Lee's mother was an opera star. So of course, Bruce Lee was going to be a leading man. He, you know, from nine years old, he was, he was in acting of some sort. He wasn't just a nine years old, Joe. He was a the main character in a child movie in China. Holy hell. So can <laughs> so, I imagine nine year old Bruce Lee punching other nine year olds? No, he was just a he was just one of those gorgeous child that's a leading actor. So it's funny because on the Joe Rogan thing, he was doing this big thing about Bruce Lee and how he's done all this for martial arts. He was a movie star, Joe. That's what he was. Right. He was not a competitive Olympic Taekwondo guy. He wasn't a professional boxer. I'm like, give me a break. You don't see this? <laughs> right. And Joe Rogan's an expert on martial arts. It's scary. Yeah, Bruce Lee started in movies, and you know he, he was a world champion cha-cha uh, dance champion before he was a martial arts champion. And your mom's an opera, opera star. Right. That's a different class, <laughs> social class altogether. Right. But we always think of him being this immigrant, rags to riches. No, he always had money. <laughs> he right. was rich his whole life. So let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about how reputation actually affects you. Um, so what we assume uh, here's here's what we're getting at. Todd, it sounds like Todd and I are just sort of reminiscing about past episodes and uh, people with reputations passing it to their kids. What we're actually talking about are connections, physical fitness, uh, and emotional stability. Um, those are the things you actually pass on. So we know from our last points that 90% chance your kids squander the money you leave them. Um, but all of these examples we just brought up, these are parents who um, their experiences and reputation passed on, but not in the way you'd think. If Eddie O'Hare passed on his reputation to his kids, his kids would have been mob lawyers too. Uh, his kids would have at least been like Al Capone's gunmen or something like that, something wild. Um, but what actually seems to hold true, uh, and we'll, um, again, we'll link off to our studies. We're getting this from Business Insider. Um, they had a good article about this. Um, psychologists have sort of done studies and found that, um, uh, experiences with popularity will dictate how children think about social interactions. So basically if your mother is, um, happy and popular, um, and they have low hostility, like, so they don't think everyone's out to get them. They don't like, you know, uh, taxi driver flip people off whenever somebody like walks in front of them. Um, if they are not, uh, particularly lonely or anxious, um, it lowers the anxiety and it raises the popularity of their children. Their children see this basically from the very start. You can't hide anything from kids, especially when it comes to like behavior and emotional control, uh, and it carries on. Children take that almost more than money as far as legacy goes. Children run with that. Uh, naturally attractive and physically fit kids, of course, will fare better in school because, I mean, people naturally gravitate toward attractiveness and fitness. Um, but, uh, okay, let's talk aggression levels. Um, was anyone in your family aggressive as you were growing up? Yes. All the higher achievers were. Okay. And aggressive means different things, but... Yeah, uh, we don't necessarily mean abusive-aggressive on this show. We I say seekers, curious. 
doers. Doers, yeah. There, there is a difference between like emotionally aggressive and just people who are like go getter aggressive. We're talking about the go getters. Yeah, well, we're actually we're talking about both. Um, uh, the people who show a lot of tenacity and grit, and they are more go getter aggressive. Um, that that sort of uh, sets kids up to, with the thought that you have you will have to work. That work is not something to be avoided. And that it's it's something you'll be you know you'll expect to do and you'll take pride in it, um, but parents that have a tendency for aggressiveness emotionally, uh, they normalize that for their kids. So if if you come home from a tough day at work and you slam the fridge door and break all the bottles you know on the condiment shelf, your kids will normalize that. They will think that's normal to do. They will sort of adopt that as their own. But if you come home from work, you grab the kids, you go run in the park, and then you come down and you read a book or study or do something, do you think that the pace and that lifestyle is contagious with the kids too? Do, do, do. Learn a new language. I think so. I, I totally do. Because like, if, you're, if your parents come home and listen to NPR and they go slow, but they, they enforce reading. Um, I was listening to a, a Radiolab episode recently about um, the invention of uh, uh, the medication rapamycis. And they were saying that like this genius or, or, or like the, the genius doctor who um, who invented like this astounding medication, one of the policies he had with his kids is they could go out and play, but they had to slow down and you know read an article from the Encyclopedia Britannica and they had to write like a one page essay on it. And then they could go out and play with their friends. So it's it's not just uh, it's establishing patterns for your children, basically. Um, and one of the one of the ones that they mention here in the article is independence. Um, people who are emotionally independent uh, and in good emotional control, children take that and they become more popular with their peers. So like a parent that shows high um, emotional independence where they are, they feel comfortable in their own skin, they can calm down from being excited or angry quite quickly, they can slow down and think about that stuff, their kids are more popular, which is something I did not expect to like be something that you can pass on. No, I wouldn't think so either. And I would think that the louder kids, the more high risk kids would be. Right, exactly. So, um... The, the shocker, uh, sorry to spoil basically everything and bring it all to a head, but the shocker for me in this episode has been you can't really pass on money with a good chance of success. You can sure as heck pass on you know, emotional stability, uh, independence, all these things that are basically about reputation. You can totally pass that on. So if our real money in leaving a legacy is more about reputation and values... Uh, I can't help but ask. A mob lawyer does not sound like he would pass on much of either. <laughs> so how did this translate to our man Butch becoming a hero? And that's right, Joe. Like this guy's got to be emotionally or value bankrupt, right? Right. Morally bankrupt, I guess is the term. Well, this is funny because Easy Ed wasn't perfect, but he was incredibly ambitious. I mean, he burned with desire. He wanted to have stuff, but more than that, he was a family man. And this is a telling story about him. So he comes home from work one day, and he's taking business classes in the late at night, and he's at uh, St. Louis University, and he's exhausted. He has three kids, he's working full time, and he's doing lawyer. Well, what he sees his son at his butch is sprawled out on the couch, eating potato chips, reading a magazine. <laughs> Teenaging it. Right. Well, Easy Eddie was, was pissed off. He was horrified, he was frightened. He thought, and this is something that most uh, parents are really, really afraid of, lazy kids. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> where does laziness get you in life? It, it gets you more of nothing. Exactly. So right away, he enrolled him in the military academy. He shipped him off to military school. No. Okay. I did not, when I did the research on this, I did not know he had enrolled him in military academy. That's awesome. Because he was sitting on the couch being a little lazy bump. Nowadays, you'd be playing video games till 3 o'clock in the morning. Back then, they... Oh, my God. Imagine if... I'm... Sorry for the spoiler. Imagine if Eddie had lived through the Al Capone incident. He would have been like... I, he would, as a... Okay, so... 
he would have never let Butch live down that he had become a hero. He's like, if I had never enrolled your lazy butt into military <laughs> academy, you would not have saved the Lexington. <laughs> um, this is another thing. So Easy Eddie became fascinated with flying, um, flying airplanes. He flew every chance he could get, even if it was a drivable area. He loved getting on planes. Okay. Now, he also would ride around in you know private planes. He had a lot of money. And so he'd even let his son, Butch, get behind the the wheel. I don't think that's very smart, <laughs> those little airplanes in the old days. No, I think it's more common that you would like put a kid on your lap and let them steer if it was a car maybe, but not a plane. But this is one thing. So Easy Eddie, he always wanted to be a pilot. He was an attorney. He was a businessman. He was a gangster. But he always wanted to be a pilot. That was his first love. So I think he wanted his son to live through his son like a football father and have him become a pilot so that's definitely legacy for sure okay now he used to sit down and i call this brainwashing your kids he'd have these heart-to-heart kids heart-to-heart talks with his father father to son easy eddie to butch i want you to become a navy pilot oh wow okay so that was his big value he he's saying so i think that's the first reason he did it he wanted to please his dad So there's two reasons. The first reason being his legacy. He wanted his son to be a pilot. He wanted to live through his son and have his son be a hero to make the name, the honor of the name. The second one, he and Capone were starting to fall out. They're starting to have problems. And after the, you ever heard of the Valentine's Day massacre? No, I haven't. Well, this is where, uh, it was kind of the final straw. There were brutal executions of some rival, of some Al Capone's rivals. Seven men were just shotgunned down in the street in broad daylight. Holy shit, okay. Yeah, so Easy Eddie was, I don't know if he was afraid or he's just sick of dealing with his thug. Now, in these, these situations where someone rats out, you know, the Rico Act, where they take down the big boss, usually what happens, and I would almost say 99.9% of the time, you, you get arrested, you're in prison, the DA comes into you and say, hey, kid, you want to make a deal? Right. Or do you want to sit the rest of your life in prison? This was different. Easy Eddie was a creative man, an ambitious man. He thought this up himself. He's the one that contacted the authorities. They weren't warrants out of him. He wasn't on the run. He wasn't a fugitive. He reached out to the IRS. Oh, wow. Okay. So he could have tattled him for all kinds of things, but he knew the only chance they would have because of how corrupt the legal system was at the time and how many people Al Capone ran. So he just kind of invented this up. Okay, so all of uh, I did not know about the finer points of that with Easy Eddie's life. Uh, uh, this all draws a direct line to how uh, to to our man Butch becoming a war hero. That's awesome. So I want to talk about Eddie's last drive. Now this one, as smart as he was, as brilliant as he was, as rich as he was, on after he rolled over on Capone, it was nineteen. It was November eighth, nineteen thirty nine. He was driving his new Lincoln. Um, He's going back from the tr- dog track, and he was killed by a shotgun blast, and that's the photo we have. Um, fired by one of two men, so he had a drive-by shooting, and it just it blasted through his window, and it killed him. There were never any re- arrests. There weren't even any suspects. You know, back in those days in Chicago, nobody saw anything. Right. Now, okay, let me ask you this, Joe. You just ratted out the most notoriously violent gangster of all time. Why would you just be driving around to and from work in a Lincoln and not expect? <laughs> yeah, from the dog track that they met you. At. Yeah, no, that's crazy. I, I would be in a steel box somewhere. Um, I would look like those footages of people with like, um, yeah, I, I would be agoraphobe. I, I wouldn't leave the house. It wouldn't be because with me, I'd be in the witness protection program, or I'd have twenty five goons with me, bodyguards. Not this guy. He's driving dude to do his new Lincoln. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Now, on the day of his dad's death, Butch was doing uh, training flights at a naval air station. He was in Pensacola, Florida. And he was flying. It was a beautiful day. And, and he did a few, you know, test the airplanes out. And he came, came down. He gets off his plane. And they walk out to him, getting off the plane and say, hey, your dad was killed today. <laughs> Thank you. 
you've been listening to The Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. On part two, we're going to be talking about legacy and if we can pass on talent. So please join us next week when we start looking into whether we can sort of education pod our kids like Elon Musk has tried. (laughs) We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. We'll be right back.